A family business is a passion play because you're mixing blood and money. Two times a colon. <laughs> if you're in taking pictures with all, the only one place to go is two hugs. So it was sort of a monopoly stage in the early years. Yeah. Two guns to Kodak store will make your prints in any style you want. Glass, semi-glass, or matte finish. The frequent expressions of pleasure from our many satisfied customers are our best testimonials to the quality of our work. Wow. <laughs> so what would uh, Poppy be saying to Joey here? Harry, Harry, thank you, friends, for your loyal patronage in the past year. May we wish you all a very happy new year, two times the Kodak store. He, he was just, at that time, uh, as was my father, a very successful businessman who had built the business. And uh, this generally happens with immigrants that come over. Mm -hmm. uh, they put everything into their particular thing, not only throughout St. John, but probably known throughout the country. Kodak was the big name, and Tudons was the was Kodak. Right. Tony, uh, Jeff Sterling. We didn't have a 50-year contract, and we had, to, in fact, we had nothing but a word of mouth. And he was on with us during the entire time he ran the, the business. In the business of making memories, both of you, three of us, take, what, what's the date? 15th. 15th of January, 2027, <laughs> 2010, <laughs> take one. You know, he, he wasn't one of these people that talked about the old country and um, all the great attachments to it. He seemed to have uh, cut whatever links he had with it and was in Newfoundland and quite happily settled and uh, wasn't looking back. Do you know why he left? Um, not really, other than that uh, Christians were you know, uh, less than 1% of the population in a Muslim country and uh, you know, were almost persecuted in some ways, I guess. He said that his, uh, it was a French protectorate at the time and his parents uh, were, his father was an employee of the French government, uh, ended up in Paris and he went there as a young boy. You know, assuming that was the case, then he left there very young anyway. So. Uh... Can you tell me why you like that picture so much? Of Poppy? Oh, this one right here? Yeah. Well, I don't know. He just looks so relaxed in that there. Leaning up the, against the post. Very casual. Mm -hmm. This is another one of him up here that I like. Probably in the early 30s or 20s. Okay. Water Street was the main shopping center at that time because uh, I'd say of all the fish that was caught in Newfoundland, 90 cents of every codfish came to Water Street, about six blocks. Very successful street, and the competition was there. But uh, for a city of this size, in those early years, to have four department stores in one city, and of course these department stores weren't only retail stores, they were wholesale business as well. They had distributorship for all the main products that came from the uh, from the mainland, or from, well, up to Confederation, uh, the buying was done in New York or in uh, Europe, and it was only after Confederation that we were sort of forced into buying from Canada. <laughs> what do you think of me doing this project? I think it's wonderful bringing to the forefront uh, a, a story of an industry that was so significant and very uh, a, a strong, you know, a presence in the community that no longer is here. So uh, to revitalize it and just bring it back to the forefront again is uh, a good way of reminding us and the family and people who live here 
what once was, what the businessmen of the community were and who they were and how they strive to create a viable operation. And yeah. that's exactly what uh, Anthony Teuton did. Mr. Teuton told me his whole, whole story of how he arrived uh, from Damascus. And uh, the ship went into Marseille, France. And uh, on the docks were all the sheets of the fishing vessels out to dry. And the, first, the uh, ship that he was on, he was on his way to New York, really, to uh, go to his brother, his brother who was in New York. So uh, the ship left uh, Marseille, it probably went into Liverpool somewhere, and then it came to St. John's. And coming through the harbour, he saw all this white on the shores of the, uh, the harbour, and he thought these were the sails. It turned out to be snow. And uh, the story, story he told me was he had only a half-sleeve uh, silk shirt on, and uh, the consul for Lebanon at that time was um, the Honourable Harold McPherson, and that was the Royal Stores. So uh, he was introduced to Mr. McPherson. I don't think he spoke any English, or very little English at that time. And Mr. McPherson outfitted him with long John's underwear and a navigator cap. I remember him telling me he had the aviator cap that came down around his chin. And they treated him so well here that he decided he would stay here. Developed a rapport and a relationship with Eastman, Mr. George Eastman, and uh, obtained the rights to having the Kodak products sold here on the island, offering a great opportunity to people here into an industry that yeah. uh, was little known, and making it available for people of all uh, walks of life. So if you wanted a camera and wanted to have the industry here, it was a great place to offer it, and it did so. He opened a little store on Water Street, opposite where Tote Tutan's store was uh, eventually, across the street, and uh, he sold brownie cameras or the film from that location. He didn't speak much English apparently, and across the street in the store that Tutan's eventually had, there was a, a, a soda fountain. And the story I am told was that Gerald S. Doyle was the soda jerk behind the counter. And he would get letters, Mr. Tutan would get letters from Rochester, the Eastern Kodak, and uh, not being able to read them, he'd take them across to Gerald S. Doyle, the soda jerk behind the counter at that time. Now, this is as I am told. And Mr. Doyle would interpret the letter and explain to him and write the answer. And he'd send it back to uh, Eastman Kodak in Rochester. Eventually, he decided he'd go, take the train, saved up his money. managed to get to Rochester, and in Rochester he stayed with Mr. Eastman for three or four days. I think that's how long he was there. And uh, he stayed with the family. And when he left, Eastman had a whole bunch of cartons all made up with uh, film and cameras and things. And it amounted to, I believe, $2,000 at that time. And uh, Mr. Turin said, I can't, I can't pay for it. I have no money to pay for it. So uh, Eastman said, don't worry about it. As you get the money, you send the money on to me. Well, if it wasn't for my mother, chances are he would have never gone down there. 
she is the one that encouraged him to go down there and uh, see if he could get the agency for Kodak, which he did in 1911, I think it was. And uh, I mean, uh, Mr. Eastman made a comment to what the export manager at that time, what's Mr. Tudon doing, throwing the cameras in the harbor down there? <laughs> because he did so well in selling them. So uh, yeah, it was her that prompted him. As they say, behind every successful man, there's a good woman. He then became more successful with his photography and so on. And uh, I think eventually moved across the street where the soda fountain originally was. From there on, of course, uh, Teutons was the photographic place. And Kodak was the big no name in uh, Newfoundland at that time. And right here is a, an old picture of the older store down on Water Street. The offices used to be at the back of the store. Because at that time it was only 309 Water Street. Okay. And then 307 Water Street was an upstairs. Let's see. It was an upstairs, there was a dentist that had his uh, studio up above. So it was initially 307, you said? Now it's 307, 309, or it was 307, 309, but originally it was just 309 Water Street. Then when, of course, he expanded, he bought that, bought the rest of the building. His relationship was very close with my father, right? but not necessarily with me. I knew him through the Rotary, and as I was president of Rotary in 1971-72, he was a member of the group that attended every, every Thursday, and he got to know me as a president, but uh, apart from that, I, I just felt part of the, our family felt part of the Teuton family, let's put it that way, mm -hmm. in those early years. I tried a couple of times to respond because I promised I'd get back to you, but I have that list of questions in front of me. Uh, did his personality's actions or overall business acumen inspire you in any way? Yes. But I uh, appreciate you wanting to get as much story as you can about your great grandfather and the to and the Toton family in general because it's a it's a wonderful family. I must say, I mean, I got to know your relatives through my relationship with your dad or your great great grand. I keep thinking of it, frankly, as your dad, you know, because he, it, it, you look so much like him. When a man can arrive in Newfoundland, not able to speak the language, not of the same uh, uh, culture, and yet within a matter of months, really, he had gone to see Kodak and got the rights for Kodak distribution for all of Newfoundland, but I think it may be all of Canada. And he was 19 or 20 years of age.
What are your fondest memories of uh, Poppy? Go ahead, Madge. Uh, you can see Signal Hill from here. Oh, yeah. Perfect. I remember some of his fondest friends were the Dawes, Chester Daw and family. And he would always call them, we're going to the Daw. He would never <laughs> pronounce the S. <laughs> and that sort of stuck, you know. Um, I just remember him being very generous, yeah. very... He had a smile. He was happy. Yeah. He was yeah. always fond of having family about. And he had a brownie camera, and he used to go down to the regatta and take pictures and sell the pictures. Across the street from where the down home is now, he had one of his businesses. He had two businesses actually. One was the American. And one was the Parisian? And one was the Parisian. Now I don't know which was which, but he called it two times the Kodak store. And one was opposite to where the down home is now, as I mentioned. The other one was in Water Street West up there, opposite the dockyard somewhere. And so did he, I heard a story about he had a phone or something? Yes, phone yes, line? yes, yes. My mother used to phone him if she had a customer at one store and he was at the other store. She'd phone him and he'd run back and forth wherever the business was. Dad did quite a business taking photograph of all the, the fishermen who went out sealing on the seal hunt. Mm -hmm. And apparently while they were out at the seal hunt, he had a fire and all his uh, negatives and that were burnt. <laughs> She made sure that when they all come ba back from the scenery, that uh, he took all their pictures again. I knew his business operation was run with an ironclad hand. He was a very dogmatic character and very strong-headed, and I'm sure his business was run in the same manner. One real big memory I have working in the stores is even in my time in the late 70s or in the mid-70s, uh, there was always one woman designated to the cash. There was one thing in his store, so that you'd have seven or eight girls on the floor, but whenever there was a transaction to be made and a cash deal done, you would hear in the store, cash please, cash please, and one girl was always dedicated to that cash. And I guess that being his reason of keeping a control on the situation, if something were to go wrong with the till at the end of the day, he always knew you'd only have one girl to address. These pictures are great here. This one. This staff party. So, I guess, uh, would that be Christmas or? That would be a, probably a Christmas party. I think that was out at Bitgoods. Okay. On Water Ridge Road. He'd have his Christmas party every year. Uh -huh. So would these be uh, good parties? Oh, great. Lots of fun, yeah. These are great. So that's here in Topsville, this other one, I guess. Which one's that? Right there. No, I think that's out where they're visiting some friends around the bay. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I have this one. This classic one. Which one is that? Right there. Oh. <laughs> so who would have painted that one up there, the the portrait? That was uh, that was taken from a photograph, and it was done by a lady in New York City, a, a former Newfoundlander. Now I can't remember her name. But uh, she did uh, oil over photographs, or copied the photograph. She did a pretty good job. That's an amazing job. Yes, he loved uh, his ethnic foods from his country of birth, because we always were very fortunate to have beautiful olives, 
Turkish delight, pistachio nuts. Mm -hmm. Learning of different cultured food that uh, you would not have known of if you were uh, you born and bred. Sure. <laughs> in the studio portrait taken in Holloway Studio, Mr. Teuton is shown with his elder son, Frank. It was as a result of the tragic death of this son that I was enabled to immediately obtain a full complement of photographic studio equipment and to open my first studio in the Exchange Building at the corner of McBride's Hill and Water Street. On the death of his son, Mr. Teuton contacted my father, with whom he was a friend, and offered to sell me the equipment that had been acquired for Frank. This equipment was sold to me at very favorable prices. When I returned to St. John's from New York to go into the photographic business, I was somewhat apprehensive about Mr. Teuton's reaction to my arrival, since he was so well established in the community and in the photographic business. I'd also been aware that he was planning for his son to open his own studio. He also had the reputation of being an awesome business competitor. All grandfather talked about was Frank. Frank's going to take all of his. Frank, 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 Frank was the oldest. Right. Frank was going to do it all at that time, you know. Yeah. It all was Frank. It was Mrs. Tudon that was in Great Britain at the time because I was, uh, we had gone over the stage of Newfoundland to Liverpool and we stayed in London, my grandmother, my mother and myself, and we stayed in uh, some place in Kensington, an apartment, and I was on the way really to go to Fenton College in Edinburgh, Scotland. And uh, that particular night a tele telegram came across a telegram, well, I think it was from my father to my grandmother, or to my mother, saying that uh, Frank Tutor passed away and that uh, he was with Mr. Tutor and helping him over the burial and so on. And Mrs. Tutor was in the same apartment. What she was doing there, I have no idea who she was with or whether she was on her own. But I know my grandmother went downstairs and spent the night with her in the apartment in London. That's as far as, that's as much as I know really about the funeral. Frank uh, was pretty young, and Mr. Tutan, Anthony Tutan used to always talk about Frank is going to take over the business, Frank will be taking over the business, and he apparently thought a lot of his eldest son, who was Frank at that time. Of course, he was such a, a lover of flowers, too. His gardens were absolutely stupendous. And anybody who drove by La Marchant Road, see that beautiful rose garden on the back that he had, and anybody who went to Topsail, you couldn't help but admire the beautiful flora that he loved so much, too. Flowers were very important to him. He always had a rose in his lapel. Now, flowers were important to him, the beauty of those, and uh, he believed in uh, creating nice gardens. So I wonder if he, you know, found an interest coming out here. He probably did. And this, this hair was set to be by a friend of mine. Every Saturday night up at the old Sterling restaurant, my father would meet with the businessmen on Water Street for their supper at six o'clock because the stores would be open up Saturday night. And there is J.M. Devine, which was the big six. There's Mr. Bowden, used to be at the uh, Aaron Sons. And then there was uh, Mr. Templeton, R.A. Templeton, they're still in business down there. And the Bon Marche, which is now out of business. That was uh, the Ennis family, right? Yes, that's the Ennis family. There's Mr. Ennis there. But they used to meet there every Friday night, or every Saturday night for their... Uh, so that was Sterling's restaurant. That's Sterling's restaurant. And there's Jeff there. 
Yes, that's Jeff at Dad's anniversary, the 60th anniversary, Jeff. And uh, next, you see Don Jameson is there mm -hmm. with yours truly. <sighs> I think our advertising budget for the whole year was probably, oh, twelve, thirteen thousand $13,000. That included some advertising on VOCM and the Evening Telegram and the Daily News in those days. Well, you can imagine when we got up and sat down in front of Jeff, he convinced my father that he would double his business if he would go on the news bulletin show six o'clock every night with Don. And the amount of the contract was $25,000 a year. Business is safe when you can meet opportunity and know it. When you can make an omission and forget it, then business is safe. I mean, when I started the first radio station, it became obvious that I had to have the key advertisers to say nothing of the first television. And certainly nothing when we went on 24 hours a day, first in the world. I had to go after the advertisers who were successful in themselves because it's no good to advertise if you're not going to follow up, if you don't have the product, if you don't have the service, if you don't have the intelligence to put it all together before you invest anybody else's money in any project. Being right is right, being right right now. Not in a, the next time we have a meeting, we'll be right. <laughs> yeah, manana, the next time. Well, there is no next time if you're wrong right now. There's only a cleaning up the mess and starting it properly. And when you have a success story that uh, a great-grandson is interested enough in putting together because it was so successful. Um, among other things he did, he built the swimming pool at the, the Victoria Park in the West End. And he was involved with all the community affairs at that particular time. A very well-known person who contributed largely and greatly towards this city and a great Rotarian.
When I was in hospital, I remember him coming in, giving the nurses chocolates and gifts. And he was very, he always wanted to show his appreciativeness of what people were doing for him. Yeah. And uh, would never let an opportunity go by, as far as I knew, where he was not acknowledging of that and would want to uh, show his, you know, his kindness for the acts and deeds that were done for him. And you see this here? I was working across the street a few years ago. And I was looking at, and this is after the business closed, hmm. and my grandfather sold the building. Oh. And uh, they had jackhammers chopping up the two down side. Oh, man. It's crazy. It's so, so cool when you get all the ads. It's Trevor. like congratulating. Regardless if you were an, a relative or an individual in the community, he was a very generous man. He had a lot of love to give. And he, he was just outstanding in that regard. A very lovable man who would always want to do and to please. Take a picture of this. Two hearts together as one. White rooms of newly born. Gardens of flowers and stone. Take a picture of us. Losing these uniforms. Taking the world by storm A hot hoop recital for this Take a picture of this Pink, white and green display Young man drawn far away Parade and past children at play Take a picture of us Based on a trial by fire Fuel for the funeral pyre so give us a song and a kiss Take a picture of this Take a picture of this A child is born His mama cries He finds his road His father dies War takes his friend Life takes his soul Love steals his heart Love steals his soul picture of this There lies the sand and the foam Men meant to never came home We are born and we die alone Take a picture of us Based on a wild road wave If it's God's will we'll all be saved Life's full with cruelty and bliss Take a picture of this Take a picture of this A child is born, his mama cries He finds his road, his father dies War takes his friend, life takes its toll Love steals his heart, love steals his soul Take a picture of this Two hearts together as one White rooms of newly born Gardens of flowers and stone Take a picture of us Losing these uniforms Taking the world by storm How could we settle for less? Take a picture of this Take a picture of this My great-grandfather chose to stay in Newfoundland and resisted all urges to venture elsewhere. His story is a spectacular story of commitment. Commitment to the new land that accepted him, and above all else, the customers he served. My grandfather inherited that business and ardently moved forward until he passed it on to my father, who I worked for in some of the stores. So having been left with that legacy, and trying to understand what it all means and put it into perspective and know that I won't follow the same path that my father did or my grandfather did. I must now move forward in a resolute fashion and hopefully, hopefully, create my own life in pictures. It was really something. I mean, 
mean, in, in, in New York City, he wouldn't have stood out. And did, I'm sure, when he went down there. I mean, this, the guy is quite something. I'll talk to you later. Take care. You were in the business of making memories. Yeah. Is that how you felt when you were... Well, I think that's what the photographic business is generally, isn't it? Yeah. Recording memories and making memories. If a business can't be profitable um, and has no prospects to be profitable, it should not exist. Uh, it, it, it ends up uh, harming people to, uh, uh, to try to prop up a business that, uh, that can't have a viable future. And uh, there might be some short-term uh, benefits from doing that, uh, but really you're just prolonging the inevitable. And, uh, it's probably a you know tough love kind of uh, situation where the best thing is to uh, turn the page and move on to something else. So, what do you think his stance would be on how the business ended and the transition of the industry? I would tend to think he would be very he would be disappointed because I think back of the time when the Avalon Mall opened and Poppy could not see a business moving off of the main Water Street area of the city. It was just unfathomable to him that you could put a store in a mall and expect it to prosper. Mm -hmm. So I guess with the times, any businessman seeing things change and... Um, he got to see a bit of that though. Yeah, he saw a bit of that, but I guess when you have a dream and you see that dream altered and um, changed because of times and customs, you gotta go with the flow where you fight it and uh, I guess there was a little bit of both, you know? Sad to see things change, but yet you gotta acknowledge that this is the way, like the horse and buggy came the car and you gotta, mm -hmm. gotta accept it. So when you look back at the whole, uh, the whole scenario and every aspect of the history of Teutons and your involvement, uh, do you look back with generally fond memories? Generally fond memories sad ending um, but uh, very fond memories um, it provided uh, a real interesting uh, career and uh, an income and a livelihood and uh, overall I, I would I'm very uh, grateful that I had that experience Ultimately, and he would have understood this as well as anybody else, it, it's business. And business has to make sense to carry on. If it's not in the mutual economic interests of everybody, then it, it shouldn't carry on. So that's 1971. Yeah. Now, former Mayor of St. John's, let's see. Mayor Muse described Mr. Tudon as a very public spirited person. Adding would be remembered by everyone who owned a camera and who sought his advice when embarking upon the art of photography. Great part in the Rotary Club. He was one of the many citizens who came from other countries who really appreciated the privilege of being a citizen and set a fine example to all of us in the practical manner in which he confirmed his pride as citizens said Mr. Mills. I think that's about it right now, Tony. You take care, buddy, and uh, keep on the throttle. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's I don't know if it isn't fun to be in trouble if the trouble is interesting, creative and, and it makes a good documentary.
start the the regular crowd in with. Excellent. <laughs>